So what we're we we prepared some stuff. Uh, so this is this is Nate. Hello. And I'm James. And uh, we prepared some slides for this, but hopefully um, this can be more Q and A because we don't necessarily know that we're covering exactly the right stuff. We have a lot of uh, potential time for Q and A at the end, but also if you just want to stop us and start asking questions about these, these different areas, that would be great. Um, but what we're going to do is try and take you through uh, how Galaxy is organized from a conceptual level uh, down to how the, how the code is actually organized, uh, various things on how Galaxy manages storage, how Galaxy manages Close the door. Yeah. It's really hard to keep closed. There's a workshop right next door. Um, <coughs> Etc. But if there's anything else, we can probably answer it, or um, it'll be interesting if we have to make it up. But that, that might be entertaining as well. So this is probably the geekiest session in the entire meeting. So be warned. This is, this, we're not going to actually use any Galaxy or go to any web pages or anything. It's going to be looking at architecture diagrams and codes and things like that. Uh, you're going to have to fight the last, the last open a couple of inches. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so um, first, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, kind of overall architecture of the Galaxy application. So, so when you start to dig into Galaxy, this is uh, this is what kind of kind of the top level map of how you should be thinking about things. And so, whenever you call, uh, you know, if you, you download a Galaxy and you run it, uh, the first thing that that run.sh script calls is actually this um, method. That there's a module here which has a main method inside Galaxy Util Pay Script, which is just called serve. So what we what we basically did is a lot of Galaxy used to be built on pieces of a stack called Pace, and we've been gradually internalizing most of those pieces so that we can have more flexibility in, in developing them. And particularly here, uh, the startup process, since we've internalized this, we can now add um, different hooks for starting up different things either before or after. Uh, parts of the web application start. And so this is one place where uh, there's, there's potential for extensibility. So um, in the future, we will probably be doing things like forking off a message queue in there as another process before starting up the rest of the stack. But because, because this was originally built uh, primarily as a web application, the first entry point is that uh, what Pscript server is going to do is actually going to load up WSGI web server. Uh, this is by default paste uh, HTTP, and so in the config file there's an egg use equals or use equals egg colon and hash paste and something like that. Um, and at this point, that that's the default. We ship it packaged with Galaxy, but uh, it's it's certainly not the best WSGI web server out there. So there there are alternatives, uh, and we may migrate to some alternative for the default uh, in the future, um, maybe Waitress or another, um, another more modern server. This then, um, so, so in here, there's a method called build app that gets called, builds a whole stack of WSGI middleware. These are basically things that handle HTTP exceptions, logging, error, there's, there's seven or eight of these in the, in the standard <coughs> stack. Um, and they can be enabled or disabled based on various config parameters, so um, various debugging tools and things like that. None of, very few of these things are really part of Core Galaxy. I mean, there are things in here like um, how we handle whether we use remote user or not is is partly supported by the middleware stack. But where thing, then things actually get important is in the web app. And so all of the web apps are now in this package called Galaxy Web Apps. And the main web app for the Galaxy application most people run is Galaxy, and then this, this class, Galaxy Web Application. And so this then uh, loads up all the web controllers and does all the web stuff. And that's, that's not, not really on here. We can just think of Galaxy Web Application as being 
the unit that handles all of the uh, web-related, um, you know, in basic, basically interactions with the user. <coughs> but what that also does is kicks it, it's it creates the main application object, and so that's Galaxy dot app universe application, and this is probably the most important um, object in all Galaxy because, and you can reference it, so, so whenever you're, for example, working in writing web controllers, you get this trans object and it contains property app, that's a reference to that. If you're working in jobs, you get a reference to app, so almost anywhere in, if you're, if you're working with Galaxy code, you're going to have a reference somehow to app which is an instance of this object. And there is one instance of this for the entire, an, an entire running instance of Galaxy. And so basically what this does is it, it, it stores all of the state related to that Galaxy instance. And so it is responsible for initializing the model. And so this is the, um, the, the metadata store, and it's a, um, a object, object, we use an object relational mapper called SQL Alchemy to map the model objects onto um, a SQL database. And so uh, the app object is responsible for initializing the model and initializing that mapping, getting the database set up, all of that stuff. It kicks off the toolbox, which is responsible for managing everything related to all the tools. And so this is what actually loads all the tool configuration files from either a local repository, from tool shared repositories, um, and so on kicks off the, the job manager, and so this is the high-level interface to uh, actually getting jobs into the job queue for running, data types registry, a whole lot of other stuff, security handlers, open ID handlers, um, every, every uh, you know, basically every reusable piece of uh, uh, functionality across Galaxy that needs some kind of state associated with it is going to be owned by this app object. And so um, that's, that's kind of the most important piece that you'll be looking at if you're looking in Galaxy. Uh, one quick yes. question. Did you mention the middleware stack? What does mm -hmm. basically, how, what, what does it consist of? So. Just some glue code or? It's components that sit in between the web, the WSGI server. But yeah, he'll show you some examples. And, and at a higher level, so they're not uh, actually uh, pieces that are connected and, and have knowledge of the application sitting underneath. So they handle uh, HTTP exceptions that might be raised uh, from, from underneath. Uh, it handles the, like, just Apache-style logging of web requests that come in. Anything that can be caught at that high level. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so this is you know, uh, saying Galaxy Web Apps. The web application is created in here. There's this um, build app.py that actually does the middleware wrapping. And so I can just take you through all the different things that are in here. So HTTP exceptions basically allows us to throw Python exceptions and for, for various HTTP events, and those get right. by the middleware turned into HTTP response codes. Um, Remote user support. Um, so this deals with if um, the proxy server is pushing a, a user to Galaxy, this middleware handles that. But it, uh, is it a kind of facade or something? Well, it's, if, if, you're, if you authenticate in your proxy server using, you know, mod, uh, auth, basic, or any of the standard, and, and then it passes a username uh, of the person who authenticated in Apache or whatever uh, down, and then. Galaxy uses this middleware to actually determine uh, what that user is that was set by the proxy server and log them into Galaxy. Yeah. More friendly interface to the HTTP stuff. Yeah. That's In what, general. Yeah. That's what it, some of them are. Others are, so the Sentry one is actually a um, one, that, one that we've built for logging to another log analysis package called Sentry. And so if you configure that, then Galaxy will log a bunch of information um, in, in Sentry, which is really useful for analytics. There's various debugging uh, middleware, so we've got profiling, lint, which actually verifies that the responses that are coming back are valid. These are actually quite problematic in production because they uh, need to buffer data, and so they 
create problems for downloads. Uh, the interactive debugger, very powerful piece of middleware. This is enabled by default, so when you have exceptions while you're working with Galaxy, you actually get an interactive uh, debugger in the web interface, and that's provided by the middleware stack. Um, transaction logging, as Nate mentioned, forwarded post handling for um, cases where you're behind a proxy with a prefix. Um, there's this simple request ID in the middleware that just makes sure that each request gets a UUID associated with it. So. That's the kind of stuff that the middleware stack is handling. It's um, it's it's kind of needed to support Galaxy, but it's not really part of Galaxy. It doesn't have access to the things that are inside the, the Galaxy right. application, and the model, and the tools, and all that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. So back to the, the yeah. So the the middleware stack is here, but it's isolated from the web application or the app, right? So it doesn't it it, it it creates it, but it doesn't really um, have any insight into all of this stuff that's down here, so that's partitioned. Any other questions? So, and then a little, just a tiny bit more on um, job management. Nate can probably explain this a lot better than I can, but basically uh, that job manager that's created by the app object is actually uh, quite quite lightweight and so the main thing that it does is start a set of job handlers and uh, it manages you know so there's there's still this high level interface so if you want to create a new job uh, you can call job manager put and it will get added and what actually happens there is it gets added to the database at that point and then one of these handlers will pick up the job uh, from the database, and so that that communication uh, about about new jobs is currently synchronizing on the database. But then uh, we can have many many job handlers, and these are uh, in a in a standard instance, these are going to be individual threads. And so uh, you'll have individual threads for different web workers. Um, that's configured in the in the any file, defaulting to ten, and individual threads for job handlers, defaulting to. Ah, uh, four. Four. Oh, I should have made one more box. Um, now, a lot of a lot of this is fairly stateless, except for the database. Uh, we we synchronize on the database, but we don't have any uh, state in the application other than things like uh, like the the toolbox. And so, we can also break these pieces apart into multiple processes. And so. Right now, everything still goes through this PayScript serve startup, which means every, every Galaxy process does have that full stack, and every Galaxy process does run a web server. Um, that's really for historical reasons, and at some point we should be able to eliminate that so that you'll just be able to start um, handlers with the app, but not the web server directly. But what we can end up doing is starting many of these uh, web servers, and in the web server we can tell it to not run any handlers, and we can have as many proce processes as we want. Each of these has multiple threads, and so we can scale out um, the web server uh, on multiple processes, on multiple machines without any trouble. Same thing is true for handlers. Um, handlers do a lot of work, and so by having concurrency uh, at the handler level, then uh, this, this, this is really important for the performance of, of job scheduling in Galaxy. The handler is basically responsible for um, a bunch of things, but um, primarily it, it has to deal with actually building up the command line and uh, at talking to the underlying job runner, which is, uh, there, there's a runner for each type of cluster you might be talking to, uh, and getting the job scheduled, monitoring it, and, and finishing it out. The, the job handles, handlers, th those threads do not have a full Galaxy stack, then. But they, the, they, they do, actually, they do right now. Um, the only thing we, and, and I, I want to change this so that they don't bother to run uh, the, the web server part of the stack, but you still need app because you still need the toolbox because you need to know everything about the tool to build the command line. So uh, they'll have that, but they won't have the web stack, the middleware stack, any of that. It'll just be, uh, they'll have the model and the Galaxy application. Essentially everything needs access to 
uh, the Galaxy application, we have no processes currently that don't use Galaxy app or use the database in some way. Well, except for the jobs themselves. Right. Well, one, yeah, so once you dispatch a job app to a cluster, that's a self-contained unit that doesn't need access to. Doesn't access uh, the database. Right. You want to talk about uh, I can. I mean, the the main reason for doing this on a single machine is because um, there are some challenges with Python concurrency. If anybody's, you know, really familiar with Python, you probably know this. So, although Python has threading, um, it has this thing called the global interpreter lock. And so, uh, when you're running in Python code, you really don't have um, any concurrency. You can only get concurrency when you're down in C code. And most of the stuff that we're doing is pure Python. And so we need to have process level concurrency to be able to really scale out. But the other, I mean, it's, it's a limitation of Python, but it also allows us to scale across multiple machines. And so um, it, this isn't just about multiple processes. It's um, about the fact that these web threads, these handlers can all be living on different machines, and so we get essentially arbitrary scale out. The only um, limitation at that point is the database, but the database is, so far we've not, not found the database to be um, limiting, and there's always potential to scale out the database as well with replication, things like that, especially if you're using Postgres. So the threads here are not uh, affected by this global, by the GIL? The processes are not. The process. Right, so within, we run, we run multiple threads within each process because All right. there's still, that you still get some gains of concurrency because whenever you're blocked on I.O., you can be running something else. So if you, you know, if, you, if, if you're the web process and you go to the client and say, give me some more data, and it blocks, at that point, you get some concurrency. So we run, we run about six to ten web threads in each process, but then we also run multiple processes. So that way we can take advantage of all of the cores on our servers. And these processes, I'm, I'm not too, too familiar with exactly, but mm -hmm. is it like standard Python? Yeah, so each one is a separate um, invocation of Python, you know, the, the, the Python okay. binary. So it's a right, complete right. separate Unix process. Um, and yeah, I think currently we, we don't fork them. We, we start them all individually using a, some kind of Start script. Yeah. Other questions? Just a curiosity about the memory footprint when you start to generate all the processes. Um, well, so it's it's not that bad. Uh, a lot of this depends also on what you load. It depends. It well, certainly depends on on what you load. Um, I don't know how much we're able to take advantage of shared memory because we don't fork, but. Uh, and what's the what on you? What's the footprint? Twenty-six to forty megs, maybe for our process. Right. And that's got all the tools, their configuration, their help loaded, so it's not that big. And you're you're talking about um, removing the, the the stack to to use part of, of, of Galaxy. What what's what's the goal of that? Um, well, there's no reason why these need to run uh, the web stack. So originally, this was all you know, one application um, that it starts a web server and then builds a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. And now we're basically trying to break it up into a set of components. So it'll still run that way by default. By default, you'll just run Galaxy and you'll get, you'll get the, the typical scenario. But to be able to scale, we want to break these components out. And so um, there's no, there's no need to have all that web stuff. I mean, basically right now you have to assign an arbitrary port and run a web server on it mm -hmm. for your handlers. There's absolutely no reason why that should be the case. So, so when you um, maybe have, have a Java uh, application you want to integrate with Galaxy, you have to go, um, you cannot access directly at, at the lower layers, you have to go through the whole. Um, so if, if, if if the Java application you're integrating as a uh, as a tool, then Galaxy, when it through its you know, tool configuration and everything, is going to push all the information needed into the either config file or command line that you generate to run that application. Uh, so I'm thinking more about the, the Galaxy API. How how I can how can I 
start uh, the job via the Galaxy API. So okay. I have uh, the tool and, and so I, I want to run. You can, and none of this affects that, right? So the Galaxy API, um, we've decided on the uh, um, on a RESTful web API yeah. for everything, and there's so Java wrappers. Yeah. And so if you wanted to run a job, you go through the web server, right? Mm -hmm. It gets put into the database. It gets picked up by handler. The fact that the handler is not running the web stack doesn't matter because you go in through the web entry mm -hmm. point to run the job. And okay. Partly the idea here is we want to have many more of, of these components, and so um, we'll probably get to the point where we replace, or we extend this startup process to be more of a, um, a flexible process manager, because we need things like uh, a message queue that, needs, that would run in a separate process. Um, uh, other, other ways to do background processing and back, you know, Getting, getting more uh, things into the background, uh, starting up potentially other web processes that are more event-driven rather than thread-based for doing um, long polling on the client side. So there's lots of uh, extensions we want to do, and so breaking into these different co components that are different processes allows us to, uh, to do some of that. Yeah. So if you're wanting to take out the web interface, and that basically means you need to have that message queue to pass information off to the handler then if it's on a different server? Well, right now, the, that, that all happens through the database. Oh. So um, in, the, uh, in the job table, when handler takes responsibility for a job, it marks that job as, as being picked up by a given handler, and then it has responsibility for that job uh, forever. Now, the moment we have that message queue, and we get to the point where we think that message queue is reliable, then we would prefer to use uh, that. We, you know, we used to use something like a message queue that was in process to do that, um, but moved to the database when we started scaling out. Yeah. But so, so for right now, it's you know, this puts it in the database, and then the handler is are watching the database, and they pick it up and take responsibility for it. <coughs> I have that right name. That's okay. Roughly. Roughly. <coughs> There's an extra step there. <coughs> there was another question. So this is a more high level, maybe you can jump in if, as you want, but but this is uh, from the UI perspective, a high level idea of, of where things are going. So everything I've talked about so far is the server side of Galaxy. And so underneath, again, we have, have the model, which um, is all of our um, data entities that are mapped onto the SQL database. The web controllers make these model objects available. Um, and so the, the, the Galaxy web application has a set of controllers, typically one for each major entity. So there's data set, there's history, there's workflow, etc. And right now, these generate um, HTML code, right? So there's, there's methods in there on these controllers that through using, um, using a template engine uh, generate the pages that you see and then process requests and then generate new pages in response to that. We're moving to, and so most of the new things that we implement and eventually we'll re-implement most things to a more uh, client side Idea and so I don't necessarily know why API and controller are different here because the API is in fact a controller. But, but it's also a view. I think that's why I sort of shoved it up there. Huh. Okay. <laughs> How we well, anyway. But just because it's a community of access, uh, right? So I'm not buying. You know, directly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So so <laughs> alongside, it, I, I would probably draw this. <laughs> don't draw the screen. <laughs> So I would probably draw this differently because the way it's actually laid out in the code right now is that the existing controllers and the API controllers are separate things. So we have the kind of old school controllers that generate HTML. And so if you look in the um, web app controllers directory, you're going to find a bunch of uh, Python modules that actually build HTML. And then there's a subdirectory called API 
where we have the API controllers. And those are much, much simpler because what they basically do is just uh, generate JSON or receive requests and make, make model modifications. And so this is a um, pretty conventional RESTful API. We're, we're trying to maintain consistency across it that gives um, yeah. fairly direct access to the model objects. And so I would call you, this the controller then. Hmm? I would call this API, what you just said, that's, that's the that's controller. Exactly what actually, I'm just right? saying. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> this is not a democracy. <laughs> 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 well, I'm going to move this box too. Oh, I see. Oh. All right. Anyway, good enough. I'll do one more, All right, just to make sure. All right. So anyway, yes. So we should, we should have a box here that's controllers, and so so there's yeah there's 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 two levels of of, of controller classes. One that is serving up HTML views, and one that is serving up um, JSON. And so this is actually serving up data and um, allowing modifications. So you can you can do posts here, you can do gets here. Nice standard RESTful API, and then all the client stuff. So the new web UI, um, so things like um, Trackster would be the primary example that's almost completely in this model and all the other visualizations. The workflow editor, to some extent, it's a mix of the two. Um, but, but most things on the website are moving to basically data on the wire. So we serve up some HTML. So that will you'll go through here to get kind of the basic um, uh, container pages that are then going to run JavaScript on the client, which will access data uh, through the API. And the um, command line. Can, so there's, yeah, there's, there's the idea the command line access via the API, which we have some examples of. There's a Python lib, there's also a Java lib that wraps the API that's available. I assume we're talking about making a JavaScript library that would be. That was used also. by the web UI, but could also be used in Node.js or whatever if you're doing server-side stuff. So this is the model, and hopefully all <laughs> new um, new major components uh, will be implemented in this this way. So if you're thinking about adding a new um, controller or a new, a new component to the Galaxy um, web interface, this would be the way to do it through the API. Or if you want to directly access anything, you can go through um, the API. All good? How complete is the API? It's getting pretty complete. Yeah. Um, it's, it's driven mostly by a mix of us porting things over and uh, community uh, interest in particular functionality. But uh, at this point... I'm especially interested in, in running yep. some tools with conditions and repeats. So tools well, I can run, which doesn't have any conditions or repeats. You can run tools. I'm not. Sure. Yeah. Are we doing not support condition and repeat through the API? Yeah, it, we may not uh, support all functionality of running tools okay. through the API so because it was developed for traction. Yeah. Is it? So we'll see. Is it? That's the goal. Is it? Is it, is it possible? To yes. Sometime later. <laughs> Trivial. <laughs> Somebody just needs to do it. Yeah. Uh, actually, I mean, so, so uh, implementing things in the web API is generally very simple because all the functionality is already in Galaxy, uh, just usually exposed through the, one of the web controllers. And so it's a pretty simple task of refactoring the, the functionality in the web controller and, and just making them both of them respond. With and this, this is an example where it's actually probably easier because there's a lot of logic <laughs> around conditional repeats that you don't need if you're using the API, right? Mm -hmm. You can just submit. Yeah, you don't have to with the with the appropriately formatted JSON. So that's a very easy thing to implement. Um, not done. Trello card. <laughs> not, not done today. Okay. Related to that, on the test framework, I know there are limitations with repeats and conditionals. How does that fit into this schema? 
Test framework does not fit into here at all right now. Um, so, you go directly to the model, does it? No, no, it does not. So the, the test framework is full stack. So it um, everything goes through the user interface. Uh, so it's on top of this. Well, it's tool exactly. wise, anyway. Yeah, through. yeah. Well, we, that's what basically the only test we have. We have unit tests, which could hit the model or controllers or anything else, but. The main tests I think you're thinking of are the functional Ooh, tests. Okay. The functional tests sit on top. So they actually, it, it, it reads the tests out of tool config and then it um, builds a set of web requests and starts up the whole thing and hits it and then verifies that it gets the right results back. And so um, when we change the web UI, the test framework will probably need to be adapted a little bit. Although the user view of things is probably not going to change that much, it'll be more how it's implemented in the browser. So it's coming into that web UI box. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Other questions? Should make a Trello card for repeats and conditionals. <laughs> card. <laughs> we should actually talk about Trello and forks. Uh, well, we can. The There's the computing together. Um, all right, so uh, I think somebody asked about this uh, code, code organization of standards, kind of part of what we said we were going to talk about. But mainly, so we have Wikipedia, we have Wikipedia for everything. 